Thank you and welcome. Um, this is a webinar series from the IENEAR Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. This bi-weekly webinar series highlights research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Uh, today's topic, very interesting topic, immunology and viral eye disease. We're going to cover things like herpes, shingles, and cytomegalovirus. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ionear Foundation. The Ionear Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, cancer of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ionear Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. Go over a few housekeeping things for us here. Um, this is a Zoom product, so it looks familiar to you. It's just like your Zoom that you may use with friends and family. But uh, for this webinar, you won't be able to chat. So chat is disabled. What we will ask you to do is to use the Q&A function, question and answer function at the bottom. You can hover down near the bottom of your screen. You see a little Q&A bubble. Click on that at any time, and you can type a question to us. We will hold all the questions to the end. And then I'll read the questions to the panelists, to the speakers today. Um, please refrain from asking personal health questions that the rest of the group may not be as interested in. But we do answer questions offline. So um, if we uh, can get to those, we will uh, get to those uh, from you personally. You can always send personal health questions to Mr. Craig Smith. And we'll also try to get people to, to help you with your questions. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to receive a survey. From, uh, from us that's uh, about today's webinar. Please re review that, fill that out, send it to us. We appreciate that feedback. It helps us uh, uh, with these programs. We're gonna add you to our mailing list or email list for future webinars. So let me introduce today's speakers. Um, we have both clinical and, and uh, full-time research faculty working with us today. Uh, first, Dr. Marie Helene Herrera. Dr. Herrera is an associate professor of ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She completed specialized medical studies in ophthalmology, basic medical degree in uh, um, pharmacist diploma and PhD in neurosciences, all at the Sorbonne University in Paris, France. Uh, Dr. And uh, joining her today is Dr. Anthony St. Legere. Dr. St. Leger is an assistant professor of ophthalmology and director of the Ocular Microbiome and Immun uh, Immunity Laboratory at the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. His current research focuses on understanding how microbes interact with the host immune system to mediate ocular surface disease. Thank you both. And uh, Dr. Herrera, I believe you're going you're gonna to start the program and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I will uh, present to you uh, uh, viral eye disease, more the epidemiology and the clinical side of it. And I will introduce some definition in my talk about uveitis, which is one of the viral eye disease. Uh, definition of um, and clinical feature of viral inflammatory disease. The treatment is very important. And then uh, we will move on to the research done by Dr. Tony Santos. Um, so uh, most of the patients who had um, eye disease related to a virus, they can have a uveitis. And uveitis is an inflammation of the uvea. Um, and uvea is one way from where the inflammatory cells can enter into the eye. And the uvea consists of the iris that the pigment part of the eye, that the color of the eye that we have. Uh, ciliary body, the ciliary body uh, is in the middle part of the eye, um, that's where the, we have attachment to the lens. And uh, the uvea is also the choroid, which is a layer, layer um, full of blood cells, of blood, of blood vessels, sorry. And it provides the nutrition to the retina, which is just in the back of the eye, that orange part. And the retina is a little bit like a film of a camera if our eye is a camera. In the very center, we have the vitreous, which is a liquid. 
uh, inside the eye, at the back, the optic nerve, the, the vision uh, goes from the eye to, to the brain from the op through the optic nerve and the sclera, which is a white coat in the back of the eye. So uh, uveitis can be caused by attack from the body on the immune system, it's autoimmunity, or uveitis can be caused by infections, so virus, bacteria, parasites, or tumors, and it can also be caused by bruises to the eye, so it's a trauma. So when a patient's go to the clinic, the eye clinic, and is diagnosed with uveitis. It can be a uveitis from anterior chamber, from the front of the eye, it's called anterior uveitis. It can be an intermediate uveitis, and mainly the inflammation is mainly in the, into the vitreous, in the very middle of the eye. And it can also be a posterior uveitis, and then the, the inflammation uh, attacks the retina and the choroid or panuvitis when it attacks all the parts of the eye. So when we talk about viral eye disease, we talk about herpes virus, HSV, herpes simplex virus, uh, VZV, varicella zoster virus, and CMV, and they are prevalent worldwide. Uh, recently, we've done an epidemiology research at UPMC, and uh, with the help of the data analytics department, we found out that 126 patients has been clinically diagnosed with herpes zoster virus in the eye since 2011. Just to give you an idea of how many patients can be uh, involved only with this zoster virus. So there are three members, as I told you, of this uh, herpes viridae family, and they can cause acute, recurrent, or chronic eye disease. Um, and uveitis. So we have the herpes virus, zoster virus, and cytomegalovirus. So first, herpes simplex virus. So just for you to know that 60% of the world population is seropositive for HSV. That means that they have been in contact with HSV and they have HSV in the blood, but most of the time it stays, it stays dormant in your body and you have no affection. But 1% of patients who have HSV in their blood system will develop an eye disease. Most of the time, the patient who have HSV in the blood, they will have skin lesions or oral and genital lesions. They are the most common. But HSV, RP simplex virus, can also cause an infection of the eyelids of the conjunctiva, which is a white part of the eye in the front, the cornea, the uvea, and give a uveitis, and the retina. And every year in the United States, 500,000 new cases of active ocular uh, herpes simplex virus are reported. So herpes simplex virus can affect the anterior segment of the eye and give a keratitis. That's an infection of the cornea. And that's what it looks like in the clinic. There is a fluorescein staining. We put a drop of fluorescein eye drop. It's orange color. And under the blue light of the slit lamp in the clinic, we see the infection of the cornea and it looks uh, green like that. And it can also give a uveitis, an inflammation that is more inside the eye, behind the cornea. And most of the time, we see the, uh, the uveitis because it gives a lot of small dots just behind the cornea. It completely blurs the vision because the cornea is not clear anymore. And it's full of inflammatory cells inside the eye. And we see it on the picture here. So herpes simplex virus, there are many factors that has been reported that triggers the recurrent disease, including exposure to UV light, psychological stress, ocular surgery, trauma, and hormonal fluctuations. A lot of those factors are still unknown. And um, we are going to start very soon a research about microbiome and uveitis 
And we will look carefully at which diet can trigger a recurrence of this disease, which medications, uh, that will be a questionnaire to the patients. And we will also uh, analyze immunomodulator and immuno um, cytokines um, that are the markers of inflammation inside the eye and in the blood. So the treatment for the patient uh, who have keratitis related to uh, herpes, uh, mostly topical antiviral treatment, oral antiviral treatments, steroids sometimes, but they have advantages and disadvantages. So they are anti-inflammatory, which is good. And they try to avoid the scarring of the cornea and improve the vision, but they have disadvantages with steroids as well. They can reactivate the viral replication. They can create glaucoma, increase of pressure. And you see on the right side, a patient who have a cloudy cornea because the pressure is too high and they can create a cataract. The lens gets cloudy and the vision drops because of this. So um, the treatment um, for uveitis, inflammation related to RP simplex virus, but inside the eye deeper, the same, it's antiviral treatment, systemic, topical. We can even inject antiviral treatment inside the eye with a needle, cycloplegic to dilate the pupil. There are the famous red cap eye drops that blur the vision, but prevent a lot of complication. And we lower down the pressure in, of the eye if the virus has raised the pressure. We give very often a prophylactic treatment to avoid recurrences, uh, but even be, even uh, despite those treatments, we still have to do cataract surgery because the inflammation has created a cataract. Uh, that's a, a picture of me in the OR doing a cataract surgery under local anesthesia. Uh, and even after a cataract surgery, and this patient had a, a lens, a clear lens, the cataract has been removed and we replaced the cataract with a lens. And despite this cataract surgery and all this treatment, we still see that there is an active inflammation in that eye. Now let's move on to herpes zoster virus. And it's this um, virus and this um, uh, inflammation of the eye uh, caused by a reactivation of the varicella zoster virus. And this patient is affected on the left side and they have a very painful rash in a dermatomal distribution in patients who had chicken pox in their childhood. So this herpes zoster gives as well keratitis, inflammation, and a scar of the cornea. And we see it again here under the blue light with the fluorescein eye drops. It's a very common disease, more than 1 million new cases per year in the US. 8% of cases of shingles put the eye at risk. And although the rate of disease does increase with age, the number of cases is greatest among people in their 50s. And the pain of patients with ocular zoster is often unlike anything that the patient has experienced before. It's very painful. They cannot even sleep at night because of the pain. And, and the, the problem is that it's not uh, only acute shingles in the eye, but that's also recurrent or chronic eye disease that give other manifestation like post herpetic neuralgia. It's pain post zoster, even if there is no more skin um, eruption or any more inflammation in the eye, the pain is still there and a chronic pain syndrome. The treatment is uh, antiviral treatment that reduces the chronic disease at six months from 50% to 30%. And for chronic disease, we often use a long-term low-dose topical steroids. More than 10% of patients with ocular zoster develop moderate or severe vision loss due to scarring. And here you see a patient with a scar on the cornea. Unfortunately, the patient comes, cannot see anymore. Um, and we can have an involvement of, the, of those uh, herpes viruses zoster virus, herpes simplex virus, and cytomegalovirus to the retina by itself. We are in the back of the eye here. It's called a posterior retinitis. We are on the retina. And it happens when a herpes virus is reactivated in people with weaker immune systems. 
and it can cause retinitis and inflammation of the retina. And here you see that the retina is not orange anymore, it's uh, yellow, and there is a complete destruction of the retina the patient cannot see anymore. Uh, it can happen also in patients with cytomegalovirus, and most of the time in immunocompromised patients, either HIV or after a, a transplantation. And we see on the right side a patient who has a necrosis uh, of the retina because it appears yellow, it's not orange anymore, but it can, cytomegalovirus can happen as well in immunocompetent patients. And at the bottom, we see a patient with an inflammation of the front of the eye related to cytomegalovirus with a lot of dots they are full of inflammatory cells just behind the cornea. It blurs the vision and it can raise the pressure inside the eye as well. The patient with uh, retinitis, when we do a fluorescein angiography, we inject a dye of, of fluorescein into the vein and we can see uh, the perfusion of the retina in the back of the eye. And we see that only the very center of, of this retina is working now and the rest of the retina has been completely destroyed by the virus. Uh, and just to show you uh, the treatment of this retinitis inflammation related to herpes, uh, we use antiviral treatment, but when the retina is affected, we inject very often uh, those antiviral treatment in the, in the back of the eye if the oral treatment or if the intravenous uh, treatment is, are not working. And uh, cytomegalovirus infection responds well to valgancyclovir, which is a different antiviral treatment. And just to show you a patient who had um, a, an, a, an affection related to an inflammation and who had this uh, nice hurt shape of the iris. I want to acknowledge uh, all the clinical team, the research team, uh, and the team of the lab who helped uh, with patient in the clinics, but also with research. I will leave uh, Dr. let Dr. Saint-Léger present his research now. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the INEAR Foundation for giving me a chance to speak on our research to help tell you all about some of the basic research side of things and how we might be able to come up with new therapies to treat HSV infection. So let's just click the slide here. Okay. So the visual system, like any other system, relies on... Uh, there we go. Okay, relies on a series of parts acting in concert to uh, preserve function. Okay, and so light has to pass through the optically clear cornea, get focused by the lens and captured by the retina and processed by the brain. My lab is focused primarily on the front of the eye or how light passes through that cornea. So when you have corneal disease, it's possible that light cannot pass through the eye. And so these downstream events aren't really, um, are, are uh, not really useful. Okay, so an interesting aspect of the eye is that it is the most densely innervated tissue in the human body. So there is a, the highest concentration of sensory nerve endings in the eye compared to any other site. And you can see that here uh, when we fluorescently stain uh, corneal nerves in the healthy eye. You can see that every one of these sensory nerve endings touches every part of the cornea and you get very nice sensation. And you can also, you can imagine it as if you get an eyelash stuck in your eye, how irritating it is. But if your eyelash touches your skin or other parts of your body, you really can't tell. So we have a nice healthy looking eye here. However, when you look at a diseased eye or one afflicted with keratitis, dry eye disease, allergy, or graft versus host disease, we notice this phenomenon where sensory nerves actually begin to retra retract and they're lost from the cornea. So you can see how there's not very much staining here, leading to a loss of sensation, leading to dry eye phenotypes and more inflammation. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, and so 
we want to investigate how the, the nervous system and the immune system interact at the ocular surface to present, prevent diseases. So we know diseases at the ocular surface are allergies, chemical burns, microbial burns, dry eye disease, Sjogren's syndrome. We also know that medical treatments, though effective, are laborious and um, the regimens are not necessarily well followed. But can, these can be lubricants, steroids can be used, but then when you use steroids, you suppress the immune system. You could also increase your chances for glaucoma. We also know that antivirals and antibiotics are relatively effective, but we don't know what that is doing to the microbiome environment, which is a topic for another day. We also know that corneal transplants are effective in eyes that are, were not previously infected with viral infections. So yes, corneal transplants are effective, but if you have previous disease, you're actually setting yourself up for future graft failure. So our, our job here on the basic research side is try to come up with new therapies that could help treat those diseases. So you can, next slide. And we're, today we're focusing on HSV infection. And you go, oh, oh too far. Uh, back together and back a little bit. Uh, okay, so HSV infection is, as um, I'll describe it here, at least in our model of HSV, is the virus infects the corneal surface, replicates in the epithelial cells. It gains access to sensory neurons in the eye, travels back along those sensory neurons to the trigeminal ganglion, where it will enter latency and remain there for the life of the host. So if you have HSV cold sores, or eye disease, it's not necessarily that you're being reinfected every time. It's the virus back in the trigeminal ganglion has an ability to reactivate. The reactivation event sends live virus down those axons to the periphery. And once at the periphery, it induces an immune response. So that immune response causes lesions in your skin like you would see in a cold sore. But when those lesions are found on the eye, it causes um, disrupted collagen opacity and, and pretty severe disease. You can see that in the upper picture there. We use a mouse model of disease, so you can click it forward just once. And mouse model of disease, after we infect at 28 days, we see these same effects where you get disrupted collagen and opacity. So you can go to the next slide. So the manifestations of uh, the disease associated with HSV is herpes stromal keratitis. It's basically just this op opacification of the eye. And it was originally thought that disease was primarily mediated by the immune system. So it was totally a disease where your immune system was fighting against yourself. However, this is not necessarily the case because one of the features we've seen in HSK is corneal hypoesthesia or the loss of corneal sensation. So there's two movies at the bottom. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to see those currently. Um, see if I'll be able to do that. Okay, here we go. Um, so we touch the, the mouse eye and you can see that it responds to stimuli just fine. If we touch the cornea of a diseased eye, you can see here on the right that the eye doesn't blink. So there's this loss of corneal sensation here. So we asked for, what, is there a bigger uh, role for loss of blink reflex than previously appreciated? And that's exactly what we found. So when we infect mice, we see, or when we mock infect mice, you see the nerve architecture is totally fine. And those nerves stain for a factor called substance P or SP. This is basically just a marker of sensory nerves. After we infect a mouse, those sensory nerves are lost. And any nerves that remain stain with this factor called TH, tyrosine hydroxylase. This is a marker of sympathetic nerves, which is a quite novel observation in eye disease. These sympathetic nerves can't feel anything. So there's nerves that are there, but they don't feel. When we, inf when we take that infection out to 28 days post-infection, you see that the nerve architecture is, is reestablished. However, there's no SD expression and there's a, a lot of TH expression. Again, this is saying that the cornea is now re but those nerves are actually sympathetic nerves that can't feel anything. So you see this, this phenomenon where um, the mouse still cannot blink. So you can see that in this video here uh, where we touch the eye. However, if we eliminate that, um, those nerves through a surgery called superior cervical ganglionectomy. Basically, we're eliminating the nerves that supply this. Um, we see that the corneal blink reflex is reestablished. 
So we ask, what is the factor that's mediating this phenomenon? And this is a very busy slide, but I'll, I'll go through it uh, relatively quickly, is that you have our disease course here. So these red dots are mice that develop disease. So by seven days, 10 days, 14 days, disease is basically peaked and you're not getting any light passing through the cornea. However, at the same time, over this infection, we see this gradual increase in this factor called vascular endothelial growth factor A, or VEGF-A. And you may know this factor from, from other eye studies, specifically age-related macular degeneration. VEGF is a known factor that uh, promotes wound healing and also tumor angiogenesis. So it's a factor that induces blood vessel formation. And we know that VEGF is actually pathogenic in diabetic retinopathy as well as age-related macular degeneration. And but what's um, nice is that bevacizumab is an already FDA-approved drug for various diseases. So we had this idea that maybe VEGF, rather than focusing on blood vessels, was actually signaling on corneal nerves. And so we performed this relatively simple experiment where we took corneas and incubated them with either sensory nerves or sympathetic nerves. And you can see here um, through this picture here, the, the nerves track through these chambers and end up at the other side. Sympathetic nerves do the same thing. They start on the left side, move to the right. And what we found was that if we culture sympathetic nerves um, and add corneas that have disease, sympathetic nerves grow and look very, very nice on the other side. However, if we add those, inf those uh, corneas to our nerves and we add bevacizumab or another VEGF inhibitor, those nerve endings are lost. This tells us that sympathetic nerves require VEGF to grow um, into the cornea. Similar, uh, you know, conversely, if we look at our sensory nerves, they grow just, they grow into these, um, down these axonal chambers. And whenever you add infected corneas to those, those axons are totally lost and uh, they don't grow. However, if you add those infected corneas with the bevacizumab or the VEGF, you get sensory nerve growth, the axons look healthy, and you're showing a direct role for VEGF in this entire process. So then we wanted uh, the real nice experiment was to, to show, does this work in the mouse? Does this work in vivo? So what we did was we treated mice with VEGF neutralizing antibodies in vivo starting at nine days post-infection and look to see if disease was resolved. So you can see here on the left that um, bevacizumab reduced corneal opacity spores. So the mice got better. Their eyes looked better after treatment. If we look at um, our nerve expression, so we see here that mice that were infected, you can see the nerve architecture here, but all of those nerves are standing for TH. So all of those nerves are sympathetic nerves. If we add bevacizumab to those um, mice, you can see here the nervous architecture is established, but you're getting sensory substance P expression. So you're getting this um, sensory nerves back, re the eye, which is great. So basically the conclusions are that through this, we showed that VEGF, even though it's conventionally known to induce blood vessel formation, actually signals on corneal nerves um, to disrupt the corneal nerve architecture and cause disease. We also suggest that possibly a, an additional use for bevacizumab, an already FDA approved drug, could be used to normalize the corneal nerve architecture, alleviate disease, um, and possibly eliminate the need for corneal transplants in the future. So with that, I can thank my lab. There's plenty of people um, associated with this, and I think we can then ask for any questions. Okay. Uh, very interesting work. Um, uh, Dr. Rare, maybe if you uh, stop sharing the screen and we'll begin our questions and answers. So um, uh, folks, this is a time for uh, questions and answers. So please feel free to go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. Um, we have a few already, but um, for both of you, uh, you know, I, this is um, an important topic. I, I think the, you know, the, the prevalence that you uh, reported, Dr. Rera, I think maybe most people don't quite understand how prevalent, how, if you were talking about a condition such as herpes, um, is it, 
one of the leading causes of corneal um, blindness or, or where does it where does it fall in terms of of um, of prevalence for for uh, people in, in in serious vision loss? I would say I would say infections in general are the most co uh, most as a mo most frequent cause of blindness infection for sure and ARPC is one of the it depends which region of the of the world because. Uh, if you, it depends which, because in Asia, for instance, we think that cytomegalovirus is a little bit more prevalent, uh, uh, but herpes and duster are prevalent uh, everywhere. Uh, you have toxoplasmosis, which is a parasite which gives blindness in some regions of the world. You have chikungunya virus, a lot of viruses uh, elsewhere in the world, but in the United States, it's, it's uh, herpes virus and duster virus are most prevalent cause of uh, blindness. Well, it very, very interesting. And, and um, uh, well, I'll get to our, our viewers' questions here. So uh, first question is, can allergy symptoms in the eye resemble uveitis? And I, I, I'll follow up with that. Can, can allergies be responsible for uveitis? I, I presume it's a question for me. Yeah, well, it, whomever, but yes, probably you, Doctor. Uh, um, it can in, it can resemble uh, resemble a little bit, but as soon as we um, dilate uh, the pupil uh, and we see the patient in clinic, we can only rule out allergy from an uh, from a, an inflammation or an infection of the cornea related to herpes or to a virus or to an autoimmune uh, coat. So as soon as the patient see an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, we can make a difference. But can allergy cause uveitis? And we don't know everything because more than 50% of the inflammation of the eye, the cause is still unknown. Okay. That's why we are doing a lot of research because there might be some components that we, we, we still don't know for that. Thank you. So the next question might also be for you, but I, I guess either one of you. Can a baby contract in utero herpes in the eye if the mother has herpes, i.e. through uh, moving through the birth canal? It's a, again a question for me, I think. Definitely yes. And we see, uh, I show uh, awful pictures of retinitis, uh, necrosis of the retina. It can happen in, in, in childhood. Um, it can be congenital herpes. Definitely, we call it congenital herpes because the uh, baby gets it from the mother when she is uh, infected uh, during pregnancy, but not only during pregnancy. Uh, we see a uh, uh, cornea scar, uh, infection of the cornea related to uh, herpes virus uh, because during delivery, the baby can be affected if the mother has an active uh, genital herpes um, infection at that moment. To add to that too, I think neonatal HSV is also a really bad problem because you can get dissemination of the virus to the brain. So I mm -hmm. think that, you know, cognition is definitely affected by it too. All right. I'll see I, I, I'm always fascinated and you presented both presented on today how um, those infections can lie dormant for so long in your ganglion cells. So uh, you can be unaware that you uh, still have that virus, but it does come back. And, um, and oftentimes when you're under stress, as I understand. Um, IV light, so uh, patients go on vacation in the summer and because of the light reactivation of the virus. I just want not any uh, mother to panic because uh, if, any mother has any genital herpes, uh, and they know that they just need to tell to their obstetricians. Uh, um, and if we give a prophylactic antiviral treatment, uh, they can get pregnant, and we and they can deliver without giving any herpes to their child. So there are treatment, but just to tell the obstetricians and to plan perhaps the delivery, the pregnancy, a little bit in advance to give the uh, accurate treatment. 
Okay. No panic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Does the shingles vaccine for adults help present the onset of HSV infection of the eye? I would say no. Uh, yeah, so because there are two different viruses, so shingles is, is different from uh, the HSV. But obviously it would help you prevent the onset of infections of your eye from shingles, correct? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it does help greatly with shingles. It just won't help you with HSV. Okay, so what happens to the sensory nerves of the cornea with cataract uh, surgery? With cataract surgeries, this may be for um, I, I know, so, yeah, so, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, Dr. Herrick can take that one. Um, uh, yes, um, I don't understand if it's a patient who had uh, RPs before or not, but after a cataract surgery, don't worry, usually you keep the sensation of the cornea. Uh, the eye gets a little bit more dry than it was before for some patients, but it's really manageable with artificial tears. So uh, no panic because uh, we opened the, the corner 2.4 millimeter. It's very, very small. So we keep intact uh, all the corner nerves. So, um, and, and as it relates to cataract surgery or any surgery, I guess, um, uh, you know, these, are, are you putting yourself at risk for any of these infections or any type of infection, I guess, from, from ocular surface surgery? I, that, that might be more for Dr. St. Leger. And, and that was my question, not one of our panelists. I just was wondering myself. Uh, I mean, I don't think ocular surface surgery uh, leaves you open for more infections. I, I wouldn't say that because, I mean, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the pretreatment stuff works, works really well. I think it's just you have to be cognizant that your eye is continually exposed to things all the time. So if you try to avoid wiping your eyes with your hands and stuff, that's probably a better a better way to go about things than, than not getting critical surgery. Okay. If we have so, time, I can perhaps just talk about a, a similar question that almost all my patients ask, are asking. Uh, if they had any herpes, keratitis, any infection of the corner related to herpes or duster or uveitis related to cytomegalovirus to uh, herpes or zoster. Can they still have LASIK, we call it LASIK surgery, it's not always LASIK technique for this uh, correction of the, just mm -hmm. for the patient who want to get rid of their glasses, you know, the laser surgery. Yep. Can they still have it if they had uveitis before, any type of uveitis or any type of keratitis? Usually I refer the patient to the cornea specialist and most of the time they say no because the risk of reactivation of the virus uh, due to the laser surgery is very high. Uh, the risk of reactivation of the uveitis is high as well because it's inflammatory. And it's, uh, mm -hmm. so usually it's not really recommended and we ask the patient to carry on with contact lenses. They can still use contact lenses as soon as they Eye is not painful. They put the contact lenses and they remove it if they think that there is a device. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I'm not sure if everybody, I, I had uh, some dropped audio there, but I'm not sure if everybody did. But essentially, then you recommend for people with who are getting surgery who already have uveitis or, or some of these other infections um, and unnecessary surgeries like LASIK may not be advisable. But, but, they can be, be fine with their contact lenses as far as yes. managing their, their visual, you know, their, their prescription impairment. And we can still uh, operate from cataract, okay, a patient who needs it, if he had uveitis or if she had uveitis or keratitis, infection of the skin. Okay. Just need to prepare the eye and to give a prophylactic treatment, if, especially if it's okay. up his so Here's another question. Can sun exposure, either outdoors or indoors with a light box, make the eye more vulnerable to eye problems and in viral infections? I think we know that UV light is directly responsible for reactivating the virus. Whether it leads to that pathology, I think is not necessarily well understood, but 
but UV light is definitely responsible for viral reactivation. So, I mean, I think you just want to be cautious of that and cognizant of that. Thank you. So, um, Dr. St. Leger, I, I, I have some questions related to your, um, your, your research with the VEGF uh, drug. I, um, I found that very interesting. Is it currently in clinical trial or are you, are you moving towards that? Or what's the, where, where are we with that, with uh, your, your evidence? So th there's no clinical trial yet. I think I think we've always we've been in contact with you know clinicians at the eye center to try to start to begin investigating how we could go about a clinical trial. It's a little bit different because it's already FDA approved. So some of the novelty of it, you know, usually there's a lot more secrecy behind things like that. But we're showing sort of an alternative use for it. So um, we just have to be able to ensure that we can talk to the appropriate people. But I think it's, they're intriguing results. And, you know, the nerve, the Jeff effect on nerves is, is an important one. There's a little follow-up question to the one on the UV uh, exposure. I guess the clarification is, do light boxes produce UV light? I guess, is a light box that may be referring to like a, uh, you know, if you, if you went to a, uh, a booth, like a, um, you know, to get a, a uh, tanning booth, uh, do those produce UV light? Do you, does anybody know? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not familiar with with uh, sun, uh, so the, the tanning salons, mm -hmm. but if you're getting tanned, you're likely being exposed to some UV lights, as long as it's not one of those spray on tan. So I would say that there's at least some UV light that could cause reactivation. Okay. Uh, when we go to, uh, I've never been, but if you go to this uh, sort of to get tan, they, if, I, if, uh, yeah. if I'm right, they, they, they put you uh, dark sunglasses. They put the glasses so on, protected. yes. When we say that the UVB reactivates the virus, it's in the eye, the UVB of the eye. If you wear sunglasses, correct me, Dr. saint if I'm if I'm right or wrong, but I, from what I've, I, I know that when, it, when you have the exposure of the UVB to the eye, not to the skin. So if you wear sunglasses when you're outside, you can prevent your activation of the herpes virus to the eye. But yeah, and I agree with that. Yeah. You go uh, yeah. on the beach. Yeah. You're safe to go on the beach if you wear sunglasses. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You can, okay. That's that's very good advice. And I apologize to my, to our uh, attendee who was asking this question. They were not referring to a tanny booth. Uh, for SAD remedies, a light box for SAD remedies. Uh, is that familiar to either of you? I think, I think, I think those don't have the UV light. I am almost certain that they don't. So in that case, I think those are, those would be fine. Those would be safe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But in, in any regards, always wear your, your sunglasses to be safe. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and generally, it's a good idea for your retina and everything else as well. Um, I, I found it also very interesting, Dr. Rare, that, uh, that these infections can uh, affect your retina. Um, and, and I'm not sure if, um, if everybody really, um, bef I, I certainly didn't understand that before. Uh, can it cause any onset of some of these conditions like macular degeneration or other types of retinal degenerative conditions, if you've if you've um, if any of these infections have in, impacted the retina. So uh, we we don't know. Uh, to my knowledge, we don't know what we are doing now with Dr. Uh, Itan Rossi, uh, uh, who is researcher at UPNC at Pittsburgh University, uh, is to um, uh, to observe the macula, which is the very center of the retina, which is usually affected by edge macular degeneration, which is the, that the retina is getting old too early. And we are starting this research, it's imaging research. We are using this device is called adaptive optics. It's just to uh, give a photography of the macula and we see so small things we see as a uh, photoreceptors, the nerve cells of the retina, they are two micron 
uh, of size, and we can see them with is much in adaptive expectation. And then we are starting this research of taking picture of the patient with uveitis, inflammation of the eye, any uveitis, the front, the back, just to see if the patient are losing their cells in the macula in the very center over time. And with a if they, they have the treatment, they have, but does it still progress? And then that's that's a question. Interesting. I, I, you know, um, and, and as common as these infections are, obviously, um, uh, those would be important answers to know because, uh, you know, we're, we're still learning a lot about how, you know, people are at risk for any of these macular degeneration or any of these, these other and just, um when I was a resident, when I was young, um, the, the, we had machines to check the sickness of the retina and to detect age macular degeneration. But it was just the beginning of it. And we were relying only on most of the time on just uh, having a look at the back, back of the eye. Is it orange? Is it a little bit yellow? It was really subjective. Now we have this fantastic machine uh, since the last 20 years to detect age macular degeneration very early. But that's why, you know, we don't know very much because it's just, we have just still 20 years of using this machine and be able to um, diagnose better age macular degeneration at the early stage. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. St. Leger, I have another question for you. And, and I, it, this is kind of more to just the field of immunology as it relates to uh, uh, to treatments for vision. It's fairly new uh, and, and you know, you're reading a lot about these immunotherapies that are used for cancer, immunotherapies that are used for other conditions. Is there a potential to continue to find more solutions for conditions that, um, that people suffer with for vision loss using these immunotherapy um, uh, you know, treatments or therapies? Yeah, I, th I think that's that's definitely an interesting point. And I think it's hopefully going to be possible. The hard part about the eye is that you only have two of them. So there's not very many willing subjects that are willing to go through these treatments to see the effects. Things with cancer, you know, those are more dire, dire straits, you're right. But I think once the proof of concepts are made, proofs of concept are made for these therapies, possibly suppressing the immune system or modulating the immune system a bit, then they can be translated to the eye. A, a separate part of my lab is sort of focused on, you know, a lot of people are talking about probiotics of the intestines and things like that. The microbiome side of my lab is actually focused on trying to engineer ocular probiotics. So. So factors that can sort of establish a healthy microbiome, establish a, a healthy immune signature at the eye through the use of bacteria. So I think, I think the eye is sort of, it's just a hard tissue to, to play with because, you know, so much is at stake. The vision is, is huge and, you know, you just want to make sure everything's right before you go and try it. Many people today maybe are learning for the first time what a microbiome is. And, uh, and so you have a microbiome on your eye, just like you have a, a protective bio uh, uh, biome in your in your gut. And places where you, where you mentioned probiotics are used to help people who have uh, those types of, of digestive issues. So the same types of treatments that you're looking for for the eye would again be just developing a healthy immune your own immune system to be healthier and protective exactly. of these conditions. Yeah, exactly. It's just trying to establish a healthy immune response at your eye so that you can prevent disease, but also don't sort of overactivate your immune system so that you get things like dry eye disease or overactive immune responses that lead to, you know, impaired vision. Very interesting. So another question popped up here. Are there eye symptoms experienced with an HSV infection of which a person should be aware so as to uh, seek treatment. You know, what are the symptoms people should be aware of? Oh. So if it's acute, it's always very painful. It's such pain. So it's red, the eye gets red and painful, even if the inflammation is in the back of the eye. Uh, if a patient is immunocompromised, if a patient has an organ transplant, uh, uh, immunosuppression because of 
hepatitis C, H, uh, HIV, or any type of immunosuppression, or is on immunosuppressive treatment for any rheumatologic disease, it can affect the back of the eye and it's not painful, in which case the patient loses his sight. There is always, if it's a chronic, if it's a recurrence, so if it gets chronic, like Dr. Sans Leger explained, there is a damage done to uh, the cornea nerves, and then it's not painful anymore. But the vision drops. So if any loss of vision, any blurriness, any redness of the eye, and even if not painful, if it's a recurrence, it should alert the patient and needs to go to see an eye doctor. Mm. Well, I, if you've known anybody who has shingles or even you know herpes um, uh, symptoms and blisters, that you obviously know they are very, very painful. I can't even imagine how painful they must be uh, to have those um, to have those uh, um, scarring uh, occurring to your eye. So um, uh, you you made it sound painful, and obviously it must be. So uh, um, Wait, okay. Precise as well, from the very beginning, we are talking about herpes virus. They are herpes virus zoster and cytomegalovirus are from the same family, the herpes viridae family. So when we talk about herpes, we think as well zoster and cytomegalovirus. They are almost, they give almost the same clinical. They're in the same family. And, and many people don't know, again, that you can still get those, those you know, um, you know, those uh, on your eye. So, um, okay, I, I don't see any more questions. It's been a great uh, audience for questions and certainly um, you guys have been terrific today. So thank you so much. Um, we'll uh, uh, wrap up today's program, but um, please, if you have any questions you think of later, you can always send them to us. You can send them to Mr. Craig Smith who, uh, who sent you the information, Craig Smith, uh, 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 Craig at ionear.org. And um, if there's, uh, and tune in uh, to these programs, you'll get an email again uh, with the survey and you'll get also in invitations to future webinars. Thank you for coming and thank you for those who've supported the Ionear Foundation to do this kind of work. Um, this is uh, exactly what we like to do is provide you the information that, uh, that pertains to the research that we're doing. Um, and so you can see right here the impact that it's making and the, and the difference it's making in terms of improving people's care and improving people's health and improving people's vision. So thank you very much and um, have a wonderful day and a wonderful rest of the afternoon.